Hello and welcome to Antinatalism This Week. There is a new book coming up, Begetting What Does It Mean to Create a Child by Dr. Mara van der Lucht. Now, the book is going to be published on 30th of April, so it is not available yet as of the date of recording of this video. But we have a very nice review of the book written by Elena Jha. The title of the review itself is quite telling. The title is Forget Do I Want Children? And that is also one of the important messages of the book. That when we are thinking about having a child, the just the question of whether we want to have a child or a question about our desires is not enough. And that is not enough because in the process we are going to create a new being who in turn will be having their own wants and desires and they cannot be consulted in the process of their own creation. That is very important point made in the book. Now the book is not necessarily an antinatalist book in the sense it does not take any sides about this question. The intention I think of the author is to present all the angles and perspectives to the reader about this question so that they are well informed when taking this decision. Talking about antinatalists themselves, the author says whether or not they have the right answers, antinatalists have the right answers, they ask the right questions and that in itself is a great good. And what are those questions? Questions like consent, questions like suffering, whether it is right to impose suffering on the new being for our own wants and so on. You know all the questions about antinatalists. But these are the questions the author is saying is these are correct questions. The answers could be different from different people's perspectives. Now, even though the book is not taking sides, I think looking at the review, the book um, focuses more on antinatalist arguments because the default is pronatalist and therefore more weighted seems to be given to the antinatalist side. If not, when I say antinatalist side, meaning about the questions which antinatalists are asking and also attacking the narratives which pronatalists generally put forth. Narratives like uh, one is romantic narrative that don't worry about having children, don't worry about the practical difficulties that you'll face, everything will be okay at the end of it. This sort of narrative is also being questioned in the book. There is also another narrative which is a biological narrative. So usually this is thrown at women. So if a woman says that I'm not sure if I want to have a child or not, or if the woman is child free, the usual reaction is wait until your biological clock ticks in. And this according to the author is quite insulting. What this indicates is that women take their decisions solely based on their biological urges. Mara says here, isn't it a sign of humanity and maturity as well as of agency that we are able to decide how to act upon our biological, emotional, psychological, physical and sexual urges. So just driven by those urges and acting like that is quite misogynistic and insulting to say it to women or anybody really. But that's the point in the book. So of course, even though it is not purely an antinatalist book, this is definitely looking like an interesting book to read too. So I'm looking forward to get the book, to get to read it. And also thanks to Elena Jha for writing this review, if ever she watches these videos. Talking of the books that are coming up, there is a new book, Antinatalism, Extinction and the End of Procreative Self-Corruption by Mati Hairi and Amanda Suknik. There is a launch event which is going to happen on May 15th on the Exploring Antinatalism YouTube channel. And before that, Mati Hairi has been interviewed this week on The Dissenter. The, the Dissenter is a channel where they interview a lot of philosophers philosophers and uh, Mati Hairi in this interview talks about many different topics covered in the book. They talk about history of antinatalism as mainly in the western philosophy from Plato to Augustine of Hippo to Thomas Aquinas and also Silenus and Epicurus and all other philosophers in ancient times to the contemporary antinatalism all the way up to Benatar and David Pierce and so on. They also talk about connection between antinatalism and extinction and also overlaps of antinatalism with other isms like veganism, pessimism, atheism and so on. Mati also explains what it means by procreative self-corruption. Overall, it was a very crisp interview. I listened to it two times. So it was a very interesting interview. Thank you, Mati. And of course, thank you to the host of Dissenter for doing this interview. Talking of Mati Hairi, Extinction Paradise is a loose English translation of the title of a show in Finnish language. It is a puppet show for adults and it tries to make a point that voluntary childlessness is an essential part 
of humanity. When I say voluntary childlessness, I think it might be meaning child freedom or antinatalism or some kind of non-procreation. It is just that Google Translate translates it into voluntary childlessness. Anyway, the show seems to be very good. It involves some puppets. It involves a skeleton, as you can see on the screen here which represents a dead person who comes back to ask a question about why people are having children. And there is also a rabbit who is a very pro-creative creature. And here you can see Mati taking a selfie with both the actors of the show. Mati was invited to for a panel discussion after the play to talk about the show. And here you can see Mati is asking serious questions about the prospects of you know procreation non-procreation antinatalism is discussing all of that with the authors of the show overall it seems to have attracted a good number of audience and so i think it's a very good way of doing activism or spreading awareness about non-procreation on a serious note mati hairi would be presenting a seminar in person in the university of helsinki on 29th of april that is tomorrow and the subject is going to be does the omelas argument for antinatalism stretch the concept of responsibility too far this is a similar argument what is what is made in their new book antinatalism extinction and procreative self corruption there is a series of talks and presentations by tanner bater in turkey in unite ortak mekan i think that's a cultural center in the city of ankara and there are many talks and presentations going on. One of them has already happened on 26th of April on ethics of capital punishment. I have on the screen here the main poster and on top of that I have also written down the loose translations of the subject. So on 26th April ethics of capital punishment has already happened. On 3rd of May it is a presentation on ethics of euthanasia. And on 10th of May, it is antinatalism. On 17th of May, ethics of animal rights. On the screen, you can see the Instagram handle and email address also to contact them. I think these are paid presentation and talks. I think they cost about 550 to 600 Turkish lira if you want to register. And at the end of the talks, you would also get a certificate of participation. Nimrod, as we know, is doing his Europe A and two different European cities. The next week he goes to Germany Cologne on 29th and 30th of April, then Frankfurt on 30th of April, Stuttgart on 1st of May and 2nd of May, Munich on 2nd and 3rd of May, and then he moves to Austria Vienna on 4th and 5th of May, Saturday and Sunday. There is a new paper on the website of Pepperdine University. I hope I am saying that name right. Pepperdine University, I looked up, is a university in California with a goal of promoting Christian values. And on their website, there is this paper with the title The Ethical Motive as Counter to Benatar's Antinatalism by someone called Elliot Cox. The central idea of this paper is that in some cases, Benatar's axiological asymmetry does not work and therefore it would become permissible to have children. In what scenarios does the axiological asymmetry does not work is let us have a look what the paper says. Benatar's axiological asymmetry, as we know, compares the benefits and harms of the person who does not yet exist to when they come into existence. While explaining this asymmetry, Benatar has many a times used happiness or pleasure as example of benefits and pain or suffering as example of harm. The paper says that happiness or pleasure is not the only benefit that we consider in our human lives. And if we replace that pleasure or happiness with some other benefit, then the axiological asymmetry does not work. In order to define that benefit, they put some criteria. They say that one of the benefits which can be replaced is an ethical motive. Now, there are many ethical motives that could be there, but they take one specific example to define this ethical motive. The example they take is the ethical motive to help alleviate suffering of other people. Now, in this example, they say that this ethical motive should be an outwardly ethical motive in the sense it should not be self-word, it should not be self-centered. That is one. And second, it does not have to be binary in the sense that unless and until I have eliminated all the suffering in the world, I have not achieved that motive. That is not how this ethical motive is. It is in degrees. So as long as I can reduce or eliminate suffering of as many people as I can in my practical life, I could be said 
to achieve that ethical motive and once i do that that is a benefit for me that is how they define to explain this they take an example of a village imagine there is a village where there is a very poor person who is suffering from a lethal and painful disease so they are suffering because of that disease but fortunately there is also a doctor stationed in that village who has an ethical motive to rescue that person to help alleviate suffering of that person now because that doctor has that ethical motive and if she goes and rescues that person she could be said to be achieving her ethical motive and that is a benefit to that doctor in other words they say that this gives meaning to the life of the doctor even though the paper does not say or does not mention anything about meaning of life but how does that defeat axiological asymmetry what they say is if we consider this benefit then this benefit can help outweigh the harms and suffering in the lives of that person and once that happens you are permitted to have children so they also say that parents should be confident enough that they can instill such an ethical motive into their children and also be reasonably confident that the children could achieve that ethical motive whether they really are able to achieve the ethical motive or not is a different subject as long as parents are confident of these two things they are permitted to have children and the axiological asymmetry is defeated is what the point of the paper is so in conclusion they say that while benatar proves that we are harmed by coming into existence he fails to prove that such harm is insurmountable because if we replace the example of benefit of pleasure and happiness with some other uh, benefit like ethical motive then it is surmountable so they say that such can replace the axiological asymmetry presented which says that it is harm to bring a child into existence because such a harm can be surpassed by the benefits experience and therefore they say that benatar's axiological asymmetry makes a defective comparison of pleasure and harm now does it really defeat benatar's axiological asymmetry i don't think so and there are a few points for that one is if you look at david benatar's axiological asymmetry the main point of asymmetry is not about whether the benefits of an existing life can outweigh the harms in that existing life it is comparison of a person who does not yet exist to when he comes into existence so before coming into existence they are not deprived of the prospective benefits of life is one of the central points of the axiological asymmetry so even though you replace pleasure and happiness with some other benefit like ethical motive in this case before coming into existence that person is not deprived of that benefit this is one of the central points of axiological asymmetry and that is why when we look at the diagram of the asymmetry this is a diagram present in the paper itself we don't do a comparison of quadrant 1 and 2 of benefits and harms of the existing life we compare 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 and i think the author and the paper have missed this crucial point of axiological asymmetry the other point is even though we replace pleasure and happiness by some other benefit like uh, ethical motive it is not clear why it necessarily outweighs the harms in their lives that is not entirely clear it is just a claim made in the paper that it outweighs the harms and the third point is even if we are reasonably confident that our children will have such an ethical motive will have an ethical motive to alleviate suffering of other people to bring them into existence as a means to alleviate suffering of other people is deeply unethical and for these reasons i don't think the paper has successfully defeated benatar's axiological asymmetry here is another very poor attempt to defeat david benatar's axiological asymmetry i was actually in two minds whether to cover this or not but i thought of covering it ultimately just to highlight one particular point the article is does pain undermine our basis of existence on some personal metaphysical discourse wordpress site and uh, they give an impression that they are talking about david benatar's axiological asymmetry but they are actually not all they are questioning is whether pain is good or bad which is one of the premises of the asymmetry and they seem to have confused the intrinsic value to instrumental value of pain when we talk about pain as an example of harms of coming into existence or suffering as an example of harms of coming into existence and when we say that suffering is bad or pain is bad we are talking about the intrinsic value of pain and not an instrumental value what i mean by instrumental value i mean that pain as a means to achieve something else which has a good value in that sense 
what that something else which i want to achieve might be good but the pain still remains a cause a bad thing to pay for so for example if i go to gym i have to endure pain so that i can achieve something some benefits of health now those benefits of health are good but the pain that i have to endure i use the word endure which is for something bad so pain is intrinsically bad a rather uh, extreme example of this could be cancer if somebody has cancer and they are cured of cancer it's a big relief and that relief is a good thing but no one would justify having cancer just so that they can enjoy that relief because the pain of going through that is intrinsically bad and this article has confused these two concepts thoroughly and uh, therefore do not ever come even come near to defeating benetar's axiological asymmetry in the last episode we were discussing about wild animal suffering and also whether human extinction happens without the extinction of other sentient beings would that be a good thing or a bad thing would that be a tragedy should we rather not have them and implying that maybe we should also make sure that sentient extinction happens um, at the same time as human extinction and therefore one of the scenarios could be until such a point we might be allowed to have children now there was a comment regarding this on on that episode and it was a very good comment i thought i should respond to that as part of the videos that i'm making so let's have a look at what the comment was so the comment says regarding the continuing to have children in order to solve the problem of animal suffering couldn't the same logic be applied to other situations for example what about those suffering on other planets in other solar systems given this logic should we continue to have children so that we can find out if life is life in other systems requires our help and i want to make two points the first point is that we go extinct here and somewhere there is life on some other planet in either in solar system or outside of the solar system and that continues it could still be said as a tragedy even though we might not continue we might still go extinct but we can accept that as a tragedy because that life is still going on and suffering is still going on there it does not necessarily imply a duty for us to continue but let us say that we want to continue so that the life over there also can be saved and rescued from suffering now the point is we have to act on what we know today and uh, today we only know that the life we have is here we most probably know that there is no life in rest of the solar system in which we are in there could be life somewhere outside of the solar system or in the galaxy or somewhere outside of the galaxy also and there are two points to that one is relying on the unknown this is similar to the bertrand russell's teapot that if i claim that there is a teapot rotating revolving around the sun uh, in the middle of the orbits of earth and mars then the burden of proof is on me rather than you who is saying that there is no teapot similarly if the claim is that there is life and there definitely could be because it is such a vast universe the claim is uh, the proof of burden is on the person who is making the claim so far we don't know and even if we know let's say in a distant galaxy some 4000 light years apart there is a life we came to know of that the the way we would come to know about that is 4000 years afterwards that there was a life 4000 years ago in that particular place it could be that we might not be able to do anything about it because light itself took 4000 years to reach us there is hardly a chance that we would be able to go there this was a point also discussed in the interview of kari makerma on lawrence's channel if i remember this correctly you can go and check the point is we cannot do anything about that whereas about the life on the earth we definitely can do something we we don't know how and what exactly what we're going to do but at least the direction of our effort could be in that direction right now everything is in opposite direction we are trying to expand our life to other planets and what not all teenage fantasies going wild so the direction itself is wrong right now and the point here is we just need to change at least the direction towards what we know which is the life on this planet towards some uh, towards which we can do something about that is those are the points about this the next part is and doesn't this have the potential of becoming endless i am also wondering why we think that the children who are born to serve the purpose of assisting wild animals and their suffering will remain dedicated to that purpose they would not let me tell you right off the bat they would not 
द आर्ग्यूमेंट हियर कम्स फ्रॉम एन एनालॉजी इफ यू लुक एट द चैप्टर सिक्स अबाउट पॉपुलेशन एंड एक्सटेंशन इन बेटर नेवर टू हैव बीन रिटन बाई डेविड बैनेटार ही मेक्स अ केस द ही फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल ही मेक्स अ डिस्टिंगशन बिटवीन what in an antinatalist view should happen and what in real life most probably is going to happen and then he says he's only talking about this antinatalist should happen view in that view he says if everybody has agreed if all humans have agreed to do a phased extinction then it would be permissible to have children through those phases as we reduce our population and analogously if we also include animals in that agreement of phased extinction then um, uh, until and unless extinction of all those sentient beings happen having children could be permissible this is just an analogy analogy to the scenario that david benatar had proposed in what antinatalist view as should happen this definitely won't happen so the question here that the children won't trust that is actually a practical question and what is probably going to happen in real life but that is not what we were addressing when we were discussing this aspect in that video